what I, I ask is maybe at the first round, if you agree, that each of you first tell a little about yourself because I didn't introduce you uh, and how you come to the subject and otherwise anything you want to add. And also maybe you can start by answer the first question, please. Is there a problem or is it is, is it as good as it can get? Uh, Lee, maybe start with you, please. Yeah, hi, <clears throat> my name is Lee Drutman. I am a senior fellow in the political reform program at the New America Think Tank in Washington, DC. Uh, and I've been interested in improper influence for a long time. I wrote a book about business lobbying uh, published in 2015 called The Business of America is Lobbying and looked at the growth of corporate influence and corporate lobbying in Washington, D.C. And, and more recently, I published a book this year uh, called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, the Case for Multi-Party Democracy in America. Maybe that'll be a topic for another debate. Uh, in the book that I wrote about business lobbying, uh, you know, I focused a bit on on campaign finance, but I focused more on lobbying, which I, I think are certainly related. But one of the things uh, that that I drew out of interviews with lobbyists, as well as my own experience working on the Hill, was that one reason that lobbyists had so much power in Washington was because Congress had really de-invested in its own knowledge capacity and its own expertise, so that lobbyists working largely for corporations uh, became the real policy experts uh, and many staffers and members just you know simply went to them because that was where real policy expertise was and also were sometimes intimidated by them uh, because that was where policy expertise lay uh, as well as a deferment to the executive branch which also had more policy expertise um, you know as for the role of campaign finance uh, and privately funded elections you know I, I I certainly believe that we should have uh, much more public financing of elections. I think that not only does, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'd go as far as to say it's legalized bribery, but I think it definitely creates a, a tremendous distortion, uh, both in who can run for office in the first place and how they run for office and who they spend their time talking to. Uh, and I think the distortions are sometimes uh, more subtle than, uh, you know, some folks, uh, you know, who call it legalized bribery, uh, you know, would, would tend to describe it as, but I, I think they are very real nonetheless. And, you know, I think it's, it's a balancing, you know, act with, with all of our first amendment rights. And, you know, I, I certainly believe in the importance of the first amendment and I wouldn't go so far as to say that spending on campaigns, um, you know, that should, should, uh, you know, should, should be uh, entirely prohibited, but I think we have to find a, a balance. And I think public financing of elections is that balance. Just before we move on. So you accept the court notion that contributions is a speech. I, I accept that. Yes, that it's a form of speech, but I think there are, there are certainly the, the the Supreme Court has over the years said that there are certain regulations on speech that are acceptable. But but you know I think the 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 better approach is a leveling up approach is is to provide support for public financing of elections. Uh, you know I don't think especially in an age of social media uh, in which campaigns have you know I, I don't know where to draw the line between what is a political campaign and what is not a political campaign ad but I know that if you provide ample public financing for candidates uh, then they don't have to spend all their time raising money and they're not so dependent on you know, extremely wealthy donors who have priorities and attitudes that are not very representative of the American public. Thank you. Amanda? Well, thank you again, Professor. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Scott and, and Lee, for uh, joining us in what I hope will be a fun conversation. Uh, I've been working on this area of, come on, of uh, how do you make our country a more perfect union, our democratic republic? And, uh, you know, this is a, an ongoing struggle. There's no any one answer. I always find it somewhat entertaining that when you get to this topic of how our elections are financed that someone thinks there's kind of one final answer when of course it feels like a tax bill is passed every other week so you know this notion that there's kind of one answer to the push and pull of how we debate our our government and how we elect our officials 
uh, it's very complex. It changes all the time. I came to this issue largely because of what I saw after working on the Hill, where not only did you kind of have an ability by donors to tell you not what to think exactly, but certainly what to think about, and the ability about who got to be heard. So when you think through this issue, it's really important to think about what you think the problem is, to, because there are a lot of solutions uh, that may not answer the problem. And I think like Lee, uh, yeah, to me, one of the, the things that I think is most dire is we actually don't have enough voices in our system. They're drowned out. Uh, many people want to get money out of politics. I don't think that's really real. I don't think it's good. I don't quite think that money is speech. It certainly has implications. But even in that arena of speech, uh, the court has upheld you know, some kind of constraints in terms of yelling fire or even noise ordinances. So to me, the problem in our system is that too few Americans have skin in the game. When less than one half of 1% of all Americans give $200 or more to federal races, that means that you have more than 99% of the population that basically don't even feel like they have skin in the game. It also means that those who do play the money game have an outsized influence. So the problem to me is one partly of participation. I want more speech, not less. I want more people to feel like their voice matters and not that simply by being a wealthy donor, you're gonna have the ear of our elected officials. So. I think there are ways and actually good policy solutions uh, that can improve the system. You can have greater transparency. You can have more incentives uh, to make sure that people actually have incentives to give. And most importantly, the candidates have incentives to pursue those small dollars. So I think that it's kind of a misnomer to talk about, you know, there's too much money in politics. I want more voices, more debate, more Americans in the game, and candidates having incentives to want to listen to those people. <coughs> Can you just clarify one detail? When you say more participation, you mean, do you want them to make contributions? You don't think that if somebody votes, they have enough of a skin in the game? That's right. I mean, the vote is obviously important. We're working actually at issue one, where I'm the executive director. We're working very hard to ensure that the vote, voting can go ahead here in the middle of the pandemic so that every person has an opportunity to vote safely and securely. But in politics, candidates do need resources and there are a lot of different ways you can get them resources to run. Uh, so, uh, but having people actually you know, give a small dollar contribution is actually, I think, a healthy sign. There are other ways to do it. Lee mentioned public financing. There's matching funds, there's tax credits, there's tax rebates. There's uh, more incentives for in-state. There's more restrictions on things like coordination where the court is like, so there are a lot of tools in the toolbox. Unfortunately, we have a system now as the polls show that the Americans don't have faith that their politicians are beholden to them and not to the big wealthy donors. Whether they be from the right, the left, corporations, unions, that's really not the point. Got it. Hello, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you, Professor, and with Lee and Meredith. And I especially liked uh, Meredith's comments about more speech, more participation. Um, I'd even be awful, I'll say more politics, uh, because th when there's more speech and more participation, there's going to be more fighting. Um, but uh, I am the president of the Capital Research Center, uh, and we are a think tank in DC uh, that for four decades has studied influence as, uh, of special interests, uh, especially in the nonprofit world, because I think it doesn't get nearly enough coverage. Uh, lots of nonprofits are as important as the Oklahoma Democratic Committee, for instance. So uh, I think that is very important. Now, to your question, Professor, about you know, do we have a problem? Uh, I think we have two problems in a way. One is we have the kind of country that the founders intended and they knew it was gonna have lots of fights and disputes. It was gonna have faction fighting against faction. They knew that would not be pretty. Uh, they just didn't think that any way of eliminating all such factions was gonna be better. Uh, liberty is the fuel to faction. So uh, that's one of our problems because, and one reason it's a problem is because some people go, ooh, yuck, 
all these people fighting and disagreeing with each other and trying to get uh, uh, you know, their little group ahead of other groups. Uh, well, it isn't pretty and I don't like it either, but uh, it is part of what a free country is supposed to, to have. And uh, the other problem I think we have is that the central government is vast and intrusive in a way that the founders did not intend. When you have a federal government that is as deeply penetrated into everybody's lives with wild complexity, uh, then you're going to have the kinds of problems that Lee and, and Meredith have talked about. Uh, Lee talked very wisely about how, you know, lobbyists for companies are often far more knowledgeable than the lawmakers and the lawmakers staff. Uh, well, there's no way around that if you're going to have a gigantic regulatory state, if you're going to have a government that takes all this money out of citizens and redistributes it all over the place. The average American is much more knowledgeable about and much more optimistic about uh, political divisions closer to herself. Uh, you know, the average mom knows something about her school board. Uh, but if you asked her, well, what do you think about the, you know, uh, cafe standards for gas, uh, gasoline uh, uh, engines, her eyes will glaze over. So one of the great ways to make this whole problem better is to devolve the power and authority to lower levels of government where people will feel that they can, that they know something and that they do have skin in the game. Again, just to clarify, so I understand, basically, if there would be much smaller government, there would be much less to fight about and there would be, be, have, be less concerned about uh, these campaign contributions. But first of all, we also make campaign contributions to local politicians. And so the question I ask you, uh, uh, if there would be smaller government or if it would be local government, uh, do, do campaign contributions in any way trouble you? Uh, no, I mean, the, they aren't precisely speech, but they're the fuel for speech. If you have the freedom, uh, Professor, I know you've written a lot of books and I want you to be free to write those books. But if nobody is free to spend money to print them, then your freedom doesn't mean much. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I, I just want to clarify, my books are not printed by campaign contributions. <laughs> <laughs> just for, for sake of... Uh, so <coughs> it, it, I, I'd like to... Uh, turn the conversation as much over to you as possible. But I have a request. Uh, let's discuss today campaign financing and not lobbying. Lobbying is a much larger topic and also lobbying is constitutionally clearly protected. No, nobody will disagree about that, I believe. Uh, and so let, let's just focus about the question if lobbyists are going to use their knowledge or checks. And so we want to talk today maybe focus on the financing. And maybe uh, I'll have one case in front of us. And let's well, can see. I, can I respond to one thing Scott said? Please. Uh, so it, it's funny to, to hear him talk about, you know, the analysis that, uh, you know, the, the big government is kind of part of the problem that in the middle of this pandemic, we're all struggling with that right now, right? That's kind of one of the questions that we're all struggling with as a country. But I work closely at issue one with the former representative Zach Womp, very, very conservative Republican uh, when he served. Uh, he's from Tennessee, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I think he had an A rating from the NRA and from uh, uh, several of the, of the anti-abortion folks, et cetera, very conservative guy. But what I find interesting is to hear him talk about how he feels the current campaign finance system actually exacerbates and feeds the big government, that so many people come and play the game, and particularly special interests, that they are part and parcel of what's creating this big government. And that, you know, one of the kind of interesting tidbits when I was, was getting ready for this, I was reading some different things, and I noticed that the American Sugar uh, uh, Association gave a huge contribution to the head of the Agriculture uh, Committee, you know, a Democrat in the House, Mr. Peterson. You know, Look, they have an interest in agriculture policy, but certainly one of the factors that fuels the big government, I think, is in fact the campaign finance system. And I, I'd like to hear how Scott kind of thinks his way through that relationship between all the people that are feeding at the trough and want to keep the trough going. Scott, I'll give it to you in 30 seconds. 
Okay. But you mentioned the sugar farmers. So let's clarify this. I think about 14,000 of them, and they got the sugar price in the United States to be 250% higher than the world market. That's not a small achievement for 14,000 sugar farmers to be able to make all Americans pay 250% more sugar than everybody else. Scott, please, it's you. Well, well exactly. I mean, did, did, the, the, the various ways that government sets prices for all sorts of things or adds to the prices of all sorts of things uh, is bad. And if you had a government that wasn't setting commodity prices and wasn't subsi massively subsidizing uh, agricultural concerns, uh, it would be much better. And, and by the way, the, this is not something that's, that's, I didn't think this up. I mean, Milton Friedman, the Nobel economist, and also, of course, a famous small government guy, it's from, I learned from him when I was in high school that one of the biggest problems with big government is that big government will end up being captured by big business. That was a favorite topic of his. The first federal agency to regulate anything was the agency that regulates railroads, which at the time in the 19th century were the biggest industry there was. And who did they hire as the first head of that agency? A 25 year attorney who had worked for railroads. So that, that of Abs this isn't a problem for me. It's, it's, it's precisely the federal power to regulate and subsidize that's the problem. Okay. Or I so I, I, the problem. This is, uh, your, your point is well taken. So let's just for the sake of argument though, assume for the moment, we are not going to have a, over the next 10 years a small government. The, uh, unfortunately, that is not in the cards. And I think uh, as Meredith has pointed out, the virus actually makes some of us think that we need a stronger government. We can argue if it should be local or federal, but I think we, it's not in the cards, I think it's fair to say, that we're gonna get a very small government over the next 10 years. So maybe for the next uh, minutes we have, ask a question, given the government we have, not the government the, some of us would like to have, uh, how are we going to deal with the campaign contributions? And uh, before, let me ask a, a specific question. One of the ideas of the court was that we don't have to worry about contributions <coughs> because we can rely on transparency. That uh, people will know who gives what to whom, and therefore, uh, if they will hear that Congress member X got money from the sugar farmers, uh, that'd be enough to stop Congress members from taking money from the sugar farmers because uh, he'll be known and people will not reelect him if he takes money from the wrong people. So let me ask you, uh, in terms, uh, it, it doesn't need to be a long discussion, but I'd like to have a quick round. What do you, the court thought, this is a major mechanism for solving the problem. What do you think about transparency as a solution? Well, I can say, I think transparency is certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient. I mean, we have transparency that the sugar growers uh, gave the money, but that hasn't <coughs> really changed the system. It uh, doesn't change the incentives. Uh, so transparency is absolutely critical, but we do have some serious flaws even now in our transparency. You know, when you talk about super PACs, you're like, oh, well, we have transparency about where the money is coming from. Well, actually we don't, because what you'll see sometimes when you look at those records is that it will be an anonymous LLC and you don't know where that money came from. So we, we have a little bit of transparency. There are some people that don't want any transparency, even though the Supreme Court, when given the chance, has repeatedly, even in the middle of Citizens United and many other decisions, has repeatedly upheld transparency as uh, constitutional. But, you know, they say, oh, it's going to chill speech. Well, we've had experience since the 1970s of contributions as low as $200 being disclosed publicly uh, for every federal candidate. And the uh, times where people have been prosecuted for any violence against any of those people have been zero. Now, there have been some quick cases where the socialist workers wanted an exemption. They got one. But this notion that somehow <coughs> your name out there is going to cause some kind of, uh, yeah, somebody might yell at you, 
I think that's what Scott's talking about, about a partisan, robust partisan debate. If you can't be yelled at, then Mr. Scalia, uh, God rest his soul, talked about, you know, the home of the brave. Your protection of free speech is not to be freed from being uh, yelled at or disagreed with. There is a protection against violence. So transparency is certainly the bedrock, but it is not, in my view, the solution. Yeah, so I'm all for transparency. Uh, but I think the theory behind transparency is that voters would see that lawmakers are taking these large sums of money from uh, corporations or wealthy special interests, and they would uh, then vote accordingly. Now, the, the problem with that is in, well, actually, there are two problems. Um, one is that while money in politics is an issue that people care about, few people are willing to vote just based on that issue alone because most people have a lot of other issues that they care about. Uh, and particularly in our current politics, in which everything is so hyper-partisan, there are very few Democrats who would vote for a Republican if that Republican uh, didn't take money from big special interests just and the democrat did and vice versa <laughs> so i'm all for transparency but in our highly polarized times and and with just two parties and most districts are solidly one party uh or or the other anyway I, i'm not sure all that transparency does anything more than just make a lot of people really disgusted at how broken our political system is. And maybe if that's enough to spur reform, uh, great. But I, I, I think that so far that hasn't been. It's just, it's, just, it's just fueled more frustration and distrust with no leverage of, for voters. Scott? Uh, well, uh, I would say that you know, transparency for large sums of money is, is probably justified. The current limits are really low. Meredith mentioned some of them, like two hundred dollars. Is I mean, I think really badly of congressmen, but uh, I don't think many of them are for sale at two hundred. Um, so, uh, but the the other thing I want to say though is, you know, in all these debates, there always are trade offs. So transparency sounds wonderful, but what about privacy? Does privacy sound wonderful? It does to me. I mean. We know there are people who have lost their jobs because of piddly little sums that they gave in some political battle. Uh, and I think that people like that's privacy should be protected. I mean, if you're a woman in the Bible Belt and you want to give money to Planned Parenthood's uh, PAC, uh, I don't think that you need to have your neighbors looking askance at you for that. And we can all think of e examples like that. So. Protecting the privacy of individuals is a significant uh, trade-off to be considered. Can you, Scott, uh, but then we talk about interest groups who make a huge contribution, not $200, but $200,000 and more. And they go by names which are opposite to what they're really for. So uh, the, the American for the protection of the environment is really a lobby for the oil companies. So do you think uh, that is kosher or uh, would that bother you? Well, I mean, the, the, it, it's, <laughs> that's a very old story and anybody who deals in politics knows there, there are all these things are, are always goofy. I mean, I will tell you that one thing I would love to see more of is, um, you know, labor unions are a staggeringly important part of American politics. The media does a terrible job of reporting on them. Um, the last administration pulled back a lot of the transparency that unions are required uh, to provide to the Department of Labor. Um, that's the sort of thing, that's one of the kinds of things that, uh, that worries me considerably. So do you have transparency for unions, but maybe also for other groups? Uh, oh, well, I, I'm not simply opposed to transparency, but again, it, all these things tend to be, like, if, we talk, if we talk about transparency, we need to talk about privacy. If we talk about corporations, we need to be talking about unions. So. Or even corporations against corporations, by the way. Because here's the thing about unions, give you two quick data points. One, if you go to Open Secrets, which is a left-leaning but very good quality research institution, and you look at the highest 
uh, organized donors of, that, uh, for all time they have records from 1980 to the present. Six of the top 10 biggest donors, including the number one, well, sorry, that just changed. But anyway, six of the top 10 um, are unions. And by the way, they give 97, 98, 99, 100% to one party. Now, if you look at the corporations that are the biggest donors, you will discover that they're more like 55, 45, 60, 40. So. Yeah, fair enough. So just to move the conversation forward, uh, let's talk about, again, those of us who think there is a problem, even if it's not. A uh, smaller government, uh, what about reasonable solution? And it, I agree, it's a complex subject and there's a large variety of possibilities. Uh, but before we go into some very specifics, and uh, please be as specific, of course, as you care to be, I, I like to use as kind of a contrast, as an extreme contrast, the British model, and I like to hear what you uh, think about it. So in Britain, uh, they, uh, they are basically, though with some rare exceptions, there is no private financing. Every, uh, the whole election lasts between four to six weeks, which has automatically vastly reduced the amount of money you can spend. Uh, if the uh, campaign spends, I know it's unbelievable, but you can Google later and check me. If the campaign spends more money then allotted to it uh, by the government, uh, the executive uh, director of the campaign will go to jail and the elected member will not be seated. And every member gets half an hour free television. It's very important to get half an hour because there has no, they can't do sound bites. This gives you a chance to really uh, lay out your position. So four weeks, six weeks election, everybody gets a chance to really lay out the position in a very elaborate way. There is no uh, room for private funds. And finally, and maybe the most important detail, but that is not often mentioned, they have something called party disciplines. So in the United States, you can go and make a deal as a senator. Uh, in, in Britain, making a deal as a member of the parliament, but you do, you no good because they have to vote in lockstep 95% of the time with their uh, uh, party. So the opportunities, I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but it's such a long way from ours. So uh, as we discuss for solutions, uh, uh, please, uh, let's also have a word uh, about what you think about the British uh, model. Maybe Lee, we'll start with you. Uh, sure. So yeah, I, I, absolutely, I, I absolutely think that our campaign season should be shorter. I mean, it just, there, there's, yeah, this interminable, it feels like we, we've, it's been going on since the end of the last election and, I, and, and it's going to go on for, what are, what are we in? <laughs> I'm losing track. It's April now. So we, you know, we have until November and it's just going to be nothing but, but campaign spending. I, I, governing has been totally overwhelmed by campaigning. Uh, and, you know, th that part of that is a consequence of, of our, our very liberal free speech regime, which the British don't have. Uh, I mean, the, the, the First Amendment is, I think, somewhat unique to the U.S. But, I mean, you point out another difference is that the, the British system is a parliamentary system. It's a party-less system. Uh, there are no primaries. And the U.S. is the only democracy that has uh, these open public primaries, which I, I think were probably a mistake. I mean, I, you know, I, I would like to see a, a multi-party parliamentary system. I think that would, that would be, a, you know, a tremendous improvement uh, over what we have now. Uh, I mean, I think there's the, the, the way in which we have a separate presidential election with a primary, plus all these congressional elections with their own primaries, plus, you know, uh, and you're right. I mean, there is the independence of individual members, you know, which, uh, but we, we have never particularly liked political parties in the U.S., uh, which you know, uh, uh, British have been much more comfortable with political parties. Continental Europe has been much more comfortable with political parties. Uh, I, I'm much more comfortable with political parties. I don't think most Americans are. So, you know, I, I, I do, you know, if, if, I, if we were to, you know, I, I, you know, to move to another political system, um, you know, I'd like to move to something more like the Irish system or the German system, but uh, you know, I, 
and who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe we're on the verge of, of some big reordering of American politics in the wake of this, this coronavirus crisis in which, great, count me in. I think there's a lot of pathologies in American politics. The framers got some things right. They got some things wrong, um, including not appreciating uh, that political parties were essential to modern mass democracy. And so, yeah, let's, let's do something totally different. I'm all for it. Somebody else wants to join? Matt, I think. Well, I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about, you know, like because it is a complex political system, I don't think uh, there's one simple answer to, to making this system work better. As I say, we're always talking about a more perfect union, not uh, a panacea here. Um, and there's different aspects of the system uh, where we have problems. So for example, one of the things I've been very concerned about and issue one we've been working very hard on is election security because of the reports of what happened uh, in 2016, not only from the Russians, but others and other non-state actors. So we've been uh, wanting to ensure that the political advertising, the paid political advertising that's running online is treated the same as the paid political advertising that runs on television. So that's a transparency question, right? It's saying that uh, viewers are entitled to know by whom they are being persuaded. That is a, a theory that's been in television. And I would note, not because of political issues, but it's uh, somewhat tied to the payola issue back in the 50s. There's one place we can start where it would at least give Americans more information about who is trying to persuade them. Then we have a problem of enforcement, you know, any law in any area is only as good as the enforcement. Um, you know, we have an FEC that is uh, not functioning, doesn't have a quorum. Uh, it's had, when it did have a quorum, it had several people on it uh, that don't actually believe in the laws that they are constitutionally bound to enforce. So uh, we already have another nominee that the Trump administration has set up that has uh, been very clear that he doesn't actually support the law that he would be required to enforce. So enforcement is a big issue because no matter what laws you pass, if, if there's no cop on the beat, the cop doesn't, uh, you know, then the laws really don't matter. Then there's other questions about, again, things we can do, coordination, the whole purpose of all the campaign finance laws and what the courts have upheld and repeatedly said, uh, you can look at as the problem of corruption and the appearance of corruption. Well, you know, when you have uh, Mr. Biden say, I, this is my designated super PAC, or Trump says, this is my designated super PAC, all the protections against coordination go out the window. It's supposed to be wholly, totally, entirely independent. None of the spending is. So each one of these problems needs to be thought through. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, I think there is the need to actually get the American people more engaged, to feel like they're $50, they're $200, there are thousand dollars of their hard-earned money uh, actually can make a difference. And there are candidates, and this is both on the Republican and Democratic side, who have been successful at mobilizing that kind of, of support. And I think that is a healthy sign in our democracy. We just need more of it. Before we go to, go to Scott, I don't think everybody who listens to us understands your point about independent uh, PACs. So the court, could you just take it out and explain? The court assumed, please take it from here. So when uh, the court was trying to make a, the, the, draw the line between what was a contribution and what wasn't, what was just in you expressing your speech versus you're providing a campaign contribution to a candidate, they drew a line that said, if you spent money in the campaign and it was wholly independent of the candidate, that could not be limited. If you coordinated with the candidate and you either gave them the money or had a conversation of coordination, then it fell under campaign contribution limits. So now, post Citizens United, we have a whole regime of super PACs, which are spending supposedly, kind of kabuki theater supposedly, independently of the candidate, but it's basically a bald faced lie. Scott, I, again, I, I know you want labor unions and corporations to be treated in the same way. Let's grant you that. And I know we'll accept you if you want a smaller government. But seriously, given the government we have, and given, by the way, we also now make campaign contributions 
for election of judges. Uh, do you think there should be any, any limits at all? Any limits on donations to campaign? Yeah, on, on, let's call them campaign contributions. Uh, no, I don't think contributions are justifiable. And they're, in fact, the single biggest source of one of the problems that have, has been complained about today. Mm -hmm. Namely, politicians spend all this time trying to raise money. Well, let me give you one who didn't. I knew him slightly, and his name was Eugene McCarthy. Mm -hmm. uh, most people on this call won't be old enough to remember this, but he was a hero of the left during the Vietnam War. He was a leading opponent of the uh, Vietnam War, though he was a Democrat. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a Democrat, obviously, who was the president fighting the war at the time. And because of a very wealthy man named Charles Stuart Mott, uh, Eugene McCarthy was able to have a serious presidential campaign from just one donor, really. And uh, so I don't think it was a terrible thing that Eugene McCarthy was able to run for president against LBJ. Uh, and I don't think that uh, that that's a bad thing. I mean, th this is the thing about these not very real reforms that so often get enacted in various parts of the law, including campaign finance. They usually just create new problems, and then people go, "Oh, well, we have to have more regulation for the problem for the new problems that we have." I mean, I don't think it's wonderful that there are so many rich men running for office, but it's absolutely a function of the fact that. Uh, you have to, uh, the rest of the candidates who can't sell finance have to uh, try to raise money in very limited amounts. Okay, so we, we, uh, we're getting close to invite the audience to join the conversation. Uh, uh, let's just uh, take a, a, another round. And so uh, let, me, let me first say uh, that uh, I uh, see it slightly differently. I take my moderator head off just for one minute and uh, say that I, I see it like at the famous town hall meeting where one person can buy a megaphone and uh, nobody else can. And we said, now let's have a conversation. And so obviously the depth of your pockets determines how large a megaphone you can buy. And uh, I don't think uh, unless we somehow get people uh, equal megaphones, we can have uh, a fair conversation where people who have less deep pockets can participate as well as people with deep pockets. And uh, finally, uh, we uh, uh, earlier talked about for a moment about party discipline. So it may seem at first odd, uh, look odd, that you can go to one senator and get that senator to pass a bill which will uh, uh, give you a, a very special favor in terms of hundreds of, uh, 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 of thousands of millions of dollars. And the reason that's something we haven't discussed, it's called uh, log rolling. And that is every senator in effect says to all the other senators, if you want me to support uh, your interest group, you'll have to support my interest group. So as a result, there is a, 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 a tacit agreement that even if just one senator uh, gets a campaign contribution, he or she can get to, to Congress over their favor. So here's a one example for which for me uh, gives clarity. Uh, we have uh, uh, vitamins and other health supplements, which uh, I think most of us would agree and certainly most public, that these are a, a kind of medication. And we would expect the FDA to review their efficacy and their safety. And, but for the last 30 years, all attempt to get the FDA to review uh, uh, vitamins and other health supplements have been stymied, despite the fact that when independent groups studies what goes into this models, they find it very often what's in them is not what's on the label. And often they're quite damaging to your health, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, before you take your next vitamin C, A, B, D12, or whatever. Well, the reason is that the vitamin industry for the last 30 years was a major contribution to the senators, one liberal and one conservative, and they blocked all uh, attempts to regulate uh, vitamins. So this kind of cases are uh, in, in, uh, in my mind. And uh, again, of course, in one minute, I turn it back to you. So uh, just for the kind of last round, any other comments you wish to make on regulation, please include a comment on my pet idea 
that people be allowed to give all they want, but will not be able to get in return any special favors. So we'll completely abide by the court decision that money is speech. You can give as much as you want, but you cannot get anything you can return with your fellow citizens uh, I do not get. Why don't we start with you, Scott, this time? Uh, okay, well, two, two quick things. One is um, your point about the, you know, who, somebody who gets to buy a bigger megaphone. The, the problem is that in practice, that just isn't true. If it were true, Jeb Bush would have been the nominee of the Republican Party in 2016. Massively more money, got nowhere. And similarly, in November, Hillary Clinton would have defeated uh, Donald Trump because she got more money than he did. Uh, we actually did a study of the biggest donor cycle by cycle by cycle for the whole last decade. And sometimes it was somebody on the left, like Tom Steyer. Sometimes it was conservatives like Charles and David Koch. But whatever it was, they didn't get what they wanted in that election cycle. So the idea that money automatically buys elections and buys the policy outcomes you want is simply not true. And then uh, the um, other thing I would say is I, I read your book, uh, Reclaiming Patriotism. I recommend everybody, uh, recommend everybody buy the book. But I, I have to say, uh, I appreciated your saying you don't want to shut down contributions. You want to shut down the, the, the benefits that the contributions are supposed to get. And I'm sympathetic with that, although I don't think it's very work, probably wouldn't be too workable. But the first one I would have is uh, I'm with FDR. I don't think there should be government worker unions, period, because they put enormous sums of money into elections, both in-kind contributions and just dollars, uh, in order to have politicians massively increase their salaries, uh, regulations that help them, and uh, huge pensions and health care benefits that all the rest of us are going to have to pay for. Well, I uh, think it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, whoever spends the most money is not in any way guaranteed to win an election. We know that uh, if you spend the most money, and there's a record of this from Steve Forbes to Ross Perot to Tom Steyer, it does not in any way, Michael Huffington, it doesn't in any way guarantee you victory. But the other thing we know is if you don't have money, you're also certain not to win. Uh, the question here is uh, not just a matter too of the elections, it's what happens after the election. You know, transactional giving, I think, Amitai, is what you're getting to, right? Which is you give money with an expectation uh, of something in return. You know, there are a number of names for this, transactional giving, crony capitalism, uh, you know, rent seeking. These are all the notion that there is uh, some expectation of, of you're gonna get something. Now, what we do know that the campaign contributions do buy is access and influence. And so one of the reasons that, that both unions and especially corporations give to both Democrats and Republicans is because they want that access. They want to be able to go in and figure out who's going to win and make their case. So I don't know, Amitai, that I exactly see how, you know, if the sugar uh, manufacturers want to give money, I don't know how they cannot necessarily get something in return. That's kind of part of the point of, of having that, uh, the pack and that entity. I think we really need to look at a system more that raises, again, I think we need to think of this, you, you have some degree of protections against corruption and the appearance of corruption, and then you have another system that raises the voice, voices of more average Americans. And that's gonna require a, a, a big increase and new incentives for candidates to wanna go pursue that. I would also just encourage anyone who likes to talk about how Washington works to go and check out uh, Issue One's podcast, Swamp Stories, where we talk about a lot of the issues we talk today. Um, we talked about today, and in each time we we talked to everybody from Henry Waxman to Jim Dement, uh, and talk about the swamp and also the solutions to the swamp. So if you don't get enough today, there's plenty more out there to hear about uh, how Washington actually works. Oh, there's so much to talk about here. Um, I want to address the point of unions, and I think it is important to separate out public sector and private sector unions. Um, and you know, I think treating corporations and unions as equivalent, which I know a lot of folks on the right tend, tend to do, is just doesn't follow the numbers at all. I mean, corporations spend 
probably about 30 times overall. Now, it's true that there are a few unions that spend a lot, but there are a lot of corporations and a lot of trade associations. So corporations collectively, uh, you know, t totally overwhelm union spending. I mean, this is, it's about, you know, probably at least 30 to one. Uh, you know, and I mean, you just look at how decimated private sector unions have been in the U.S. and, and the extent to which the laws have basically made it incredibly difficult for unions to organize in the U.S. when you compare the U.S. to any other advanced democracy and look at the labor regulations. Uh, and so the idea that private sector unions are wielding equivalent power to, to corporations is frankly laughable. Um, you know, on the, the question of, you know, I mean, I want to echo Meredith's point that self-funded candidates usually actually don't do poorly. Uh, sorry, usually do do quite poorly. Uh, so spending the most money, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily buy you something. But you know, what a lot of what, what happens in the course of the campaign is that you're holding a lot of fundraisers because you need to prove that you can raise money. And when you're holding fundraisers, you're not spending time with working class people who have you know, problems with, with money or healthcare, you're spending time with very rich donors who have problems with, you know, that, that they're being taxed too much or, you know, that, you know that, that there's some regulation, pesky regulation that's interfering with their business. And those are the concerns that lawmakers bring to Washington. So, you know, they may not, it may not be a purely transactional thing, but, you know, when you're out and about talking to donors, raising money, you're, you're, you're listening and you're, you're often agreeing and you're nodding because you want their money, which takes us to, I think, a, a, an issue that we haven't talked about. We've talked about special interests lobbying lawmakers, but there's also lawmakers who need to constantly be raising money who are trying to shake down private interests. Uh, and, you know, I think that's there, you know, there's a sense that there's, you know, crony capitalism or friend seeking, um, you know, from, from businesses, but also lawmakers themselves, you know, are constantly trying to generate issues that then they can say, oh, well, you better come to my fundraiser because we might not, you know, we might not extend your, your tax break this year. Uh, and that creates perverse incentives for lawmakers who know that they have to raise all this money because they have to meet their demands, uh, which then creates further economic distortions, uh, which gets to that point, I think, Meredith, that you were indicating about where Zach Womp was talking about how the, the funding fuel, fuels big government because lawmakers are inventing new threats uh, to, to shake down corporations. Um, Amitai, as uh, for your suggestion about you know unlimited money but with no uh as long as there's no benefit i think it's it's really it would be really hard i agree with scott that it would be really hard to to implement that in practice because what what defines a benefit and how do you and then how do you enforce that who who gets punished uh if if, if something winds up benefiting uh, a donor, especially since a lot of legislation is not. I mean, I th think that the model that 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 individual lawmakers are influenced. If one lawmaker is influenced, doesn't matter. It's when a bunch of lawmakers get influenced enough to pass a bill. That's when you get a problem. But then you have a, a challenge of how do you attribute re a causal responsibility when it's when it's a bunch of folks who are passing a, a law together. Uh, which often happens. And, you know, maybe, maybe there's some amount of log rolling. Sure. Although I think in today's Congress so much, I mean, you talk about party discipline, uh, there, there has never been greater party discipline in the U S Congress and you know, the banning of earmarks has, has undermined a lot of this log rolling and we can debate the role of earmarks. I know Meredith thinks we ought to bring them back. I'm, I'm fine with bringing them back, although I don't think it would do much to make Congress more functional. Uh, although I see their benefit. But. Well, one of the things I, I, I want to just emphasize what Lee was saying about the shakedown, uh, because this is really one of the dynamics. Everybody talks about legalized bribery. It really is, uh, in many cases, the legalized shakedown where people feel like if they don't give, something is either going to bad happen to their company or something that is needed will not happen. But you have to remember when particularly members of Congress are dialing for dollars, right? Supposedly spending, in some cases, depending on your position, as much as 40% of your time dialing for dollars. 
you're not only, in many cases, dialing for your own campaign. After all, there's very few competitive races. What you're really doing is dialing somewhat for your own campaign and then all the party committees. So if you're the chair of a committee or the ranking member, you can be expected to give to the party uh, maybe a million dollars or more out of your campaign account to help the party. So the people that may be in very safe seats, that may not even have had a competitive election for years, they're out there dialing for dollars, telling folks that uh, if you're on armed services and you're a defense contractor, you need to give money because you have these dues that you're expected, the party dues, to help with the party. So this kind of treadmill of constant demand for money and constant demand being made on a special interest, you have to understand it is, as Lee mentioned, kind of they're, they're both happening at the same time. The desire to influence what's going on in Washington and the shakedown that is happening because if you want to be the chair of an influential committee, you got to be able to fork over uh, large amounts of money to the party. Well, I, first of all, let me, I forgot to tell you at the beginning, this is our first time be doing this online or Zooming. In the past, we did this face-to-face -face on Arena stage. So as far as I can tell, this was a wonderful, very productive and enlightening conversation. And now, uh, with the help of my colleagues behind the scene, we're going to try even something more intrepid. We're going to try to bring the audience on to ask uh, uh, questions. And I, I delegated the authority to decide who gets to ask questions or make comments first. So uh, would you please call on the first uh, interluder? Mirror, mirror on the wall, let them talk. <laughs> yes, we have Ramona. Ramona, if you would like to ask your question, I will unmute you now. Uh, so my question was for the panelists. Um, when you were talking about the um, the open access to donor information, what about the people who may, may maybe were not beat up, but lost jobs or other things that they valued? Because, for example, in the Proposition Eight in California they did lose um, suasion and jobs. Uh, is the question clear? Well, I think she's saying, uh, you know, like Proposition 8 is the only one I've ever heard in, uh, in these many, many years of experience of a system in which uh, donations to federal candidates as low as $200 have been disclosed. And there has not been a record of any kind of uh, violence or people losing their jobs, or I think Scott, I think one of the point you raised, somehow neighbor shame. Uh, that's not uh, been a problem in the system. It's a theoretical problem. Now, Proposition 8 did have some reports uh, at the state. It was a ballot measure. It dealt with uh, some very controversial social issues. But uh, out of all these experiences since the 1970s, if you take that entire experience and look where we are now, that was to some degree an outlier. But obviously losing your job or having any kind of retribution uh, is, is not acceptable, shouldn't be acceptable, but it also should be dealt with. And uh, you know, that is, uh, there hopefully would be remedies that would be in place, but because of a, a few reports, some of which I've noticed are, are anecdotal and I don't by any means know exactly what went on in California for the ballot measure. But my hope is like in any case, if people violate either the law or do something that is illegal retribution, that in fact, there would be enforcement against that. Well, I, I'd like to ask how, because there absolutely were people who were harassed and they're, uh, in fact, they were harassed because they were members of a minority religion. Uh, and there was lots of ugliness in California over that. So how Scott, would you you're the one that was saying we want a robust partisan, a partisan discussion. <laughs> yeah, so being right. harassed and being said, you know, I don't agree with you or yelling at someone, isn't that what you were just making the case for? And doesn't that happen all the time in our politics? 
Yeah, well, lots of it does, yes, uh, in, in many different ways, and, and, with, and not just with political contributions disclosure, with, uh, with nonprofits uh, contribution disclosures too. Well, I want to thank Ramona for, for the question because it is part of the robust debate here. You know, uh, when Justice Scalia wrote about the, uh, the home of the brave, uh, it is a recognition that you get bruised often in the political sphere. Uh, people can say ugly things. People can do ugly things. Uh, you know, uh, this is part of the, you know, the whole reason that we have our system of, and we have this kind of democratic republic is that conflict is innate in the human condition. And what we're trying to do in our system is say, we're not, we know conflict is going to happen, but we want to try and manage that peacefully because the other alternative is war or violence. So the whole purpose of a democratic republic is to manage conflict. So I agree with Scott to the degree that conflict, I don't know whether you want it or not, it's inevitable. The question is, how do you manage that conflict in the most constructive way and do it in a way that uh, avoids as much violence as possible? And I think up to now, um, we've had some times where it's been good, We've had some times when we've had a civil war. So it's an ongoing great challenge to any nation to manage conflict in a peaceful way. And sometimes we do it better than others. I want to add another point about anonymity and privacy, if I can, uh, which is that there was a, a time in which you used to be able to post comments anonymously on the internet. And, and, and to some extent, you still are able to do things anonymously on the internet. And those anonymous comments get really nasty really fast. When people have to stand behind their own identity and have to attach comments with their name, uh, they tend to engage in politics in a little bit of a more respectful and civil way. So you know, I, I admit there may be moments in which people are harassed for their political contributions. And as Scott said, you know, conflict is part of politics and, you know, I, Maybe if somebody's at, a, at an organization or an institution where everybody disagrees with them, maybe they'd be happier somewhere else. Um, but I, I think the alternative to, to saying that nobody should ever be harassed for their, if people find out their political views is to say, we should all be able to express our political views anonymously. And when you hide behind that anonymity, it, it creates a condition where people start to get really nasty and, and, really mean it. It, it. If I were behind a curtain, I, I might have harsher words to say for you all, but you're seeing my face. And this is part of civil dialogue, is having the courage to say things face to face over the internet with my name attached. And I think that is crucial to a democracy where we have the respect for each other to own up and say, this is what I believe. And I'm willing to show up and, and say, this is what I believe. If we don't have that, I think we devolve into something much uglier. Thank you. I'm keen to bring in the next uh, uh, commentator questioner, but I, I do need to add one short note. Some of what I heard this, uh, the last conversation is for me a little too, uh, too sanguine, a little too happy. I think the overwhelming majority of Americans are very, very unhappy with the government. And, and on the left and on the right, they vote for disruptors, for protesters, for radical ideas on both sides. And I believe that one of the reasons, and actually it's not I believe, polls show that one of the reasons they feel so disenchanted is they feel they are not being heard and the government is governed by special interests rather than responding to, to the public voice and the public need. Now, if campaign contributions are the only reason uh, politicians uh, pay more mind to special interests uh, and not to the voters. That's a different question. But I don't want to leave on the, uh, on the note that while we fight each other, we scream at each other, but basically things are in good health. That's not the way uh, I see it. Uh, you all got this chance in a minute, but let's bring in the next uh, uh, commentator questioner, please. Hi, our next question comes from Justin. Justin, you are on. All right, hopefully my audio is clear. Um, I, first of all, thank you for putting this on. I think it was very interesting, um, but I'd like to ask, so basically considering that 
congressional races, uh, presidential races, their campaigns are, are one of the largest focal points for big money to, um, to get targeted to. And since the Supreme Court over the last several decades has ruled repeatedly uh, to basically allow more of that money's influence um, to be legal, do you feel that a constitutional amendment would be required to address some of the runaway money that's that's happening in in the uh, in our politics right now? Anybody? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think it, it would be extremely challenging to get a constitutional amendment um, on uh, campaign finance passed given the partisan times that we're in. Um, I, I also have some concerns about how you would actually be able to write such an amendment uh, that, that would, in a way that's actually workable and enforceable. I think a much more practical mode of dealing with uh, campaign finance problems is some form of public financing of election, whether it's direct money given to candidates or parties or, or a, a, a small donor matching uh, program with such as the uh, HR1 proposal, six to one uh, public money for every $1 in small donor donations or the voucher system, which Seattle has experimented with. I think there are solutions that are practical, constitutional leveling up solutions. I think at this point, you know, given where our politics are, uh, any efforts invested in a constitutional amendment are probably wasted. I'll jump in real quick uh, and second Lee's point about the, uh, it's hard to imagine how one would uh, write that amendment if it were desirable in the first place. Uh, but I would just add that's a problem with any of the laws that are being discussed here. Uh, the folks who are going to write and pass any laws to put money into, put government money into politics or restrict money from various sources, they're all going to be written by one type of human being. And he's called incumbent. Uh, incumbents are always going to be the ones writing and passing the laws. And I do not trust any of the incumbents uh, to do so in a genuinely fair way. Uh, this is, again, one of the reasons Americans, I think, get alienated from politics because they don't spend all this time that folks like us do carefully reading and parsing all these different things. It's just wildly complicated and obscure to them. And, uh, and they realize that all the different groups here in DC are trying to pull a fast one over them and everybody's angling for a little uh, help for his team. And I'll just add in, I think uh, Lee kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of just the political situation. Uh, right now, uh, we have a Republican majority in the Senate that's led by Mitch McConnell, and Mitch McConnell uh, has pretty much made it his business over the last uh, 20 to 30 or longer years in the Senate to ensure that no proposal of this kind will go forward. That doesn't mean that uh, in, you know, in the future that a constitutional amendment uh, couldn't find the support it needs, but it, right now, uh, even if he isn't majority leader, Senator McConnell has made very clear he will lay down on the tracks, even if he goes and let's say has uh, becomes a minority leader and is only at 47 Republicans, that's enough to block a filibuster and certainly falls far short of what is needed for a constitutional amendment. I've looked at a number of the amendments that have been introduced. I certainly share a lot of the sentiment, but I can also tell you having worked on this issue for many years that um, coming up with language that will achieve what uh, many folks that are supporting the amendment wanted to achieve is a challenge. And uh, so, you know, but, but clearly the Supreme Court uh, led under, under Chief Justice Roberts has taken off on a path that has uh, empowered those wealthy interests uh, in contrast to uh, probably average Americans. And that's just the fact of the matter. And I think there are a lot of folks that are very concerned about it. I think they're concerned about the path our politics is taking. And uh, in this time of pandemic, you know, it's really important that we have trust that our government is gonna make decisions and our politicians, especially are gonna make decisions based on what's best for the American people 
not what's best for their politics or for themselves. And so when you have that disruption of trust between the people of our government uh, in these times of crisis, it's very dangerous for a democracy or a democratic republic as we are. So I think that the concerns that the American people have are well-placed, but the alternative is actually to fight back, to say there are things that we can do in the meantime. Uh, we've talked about some of those here today. Uh, uh, there we, are we, ways we, to do we, that. We get to some more questions, okay. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you, you, you understand you have quite a few more people, okay? Let me give you another line to summarize. Meredith? No, I'm done, that was it. Uh, okay, uh, let's have another question, please, or comments. Hi, um, our next question comes from Michael. His question is to Lee. He says, Lee, you say reform can happen when one, the problem is clear, two, the solution is clear, and three, the public demands reform, and four, elected officials can support, etc. Where do you or the others think we are with this issue? Is the problem clear? Is the solution clear? I think the problem is clear, uh, but I think uh, there are multiple problems and uh, I think we aren't, haven't quite achieved consensus on which problem is the most important. Uh, I, I don't think the solution, I mean, to me, there are a few solutions, but I don't think we have widespread agreement on, on the solution. Now, I think that I would support a system of public financing, uh, you know, but I think a lot of folks in the public might consider that welfare for politicians. Uh, and so I think, I think we're, we're somewhat far from, from a, a clear solution. I mean, I think as for, you know, members of Congress doing things in their own interest, um, which is a point that Scott raised, you know, frankly, and, and Meredith knows this quite well, uh, that most incumbent members of Congress hate the current system because they're on the phone all the time. And especially former members, the first thing they do when they retire is they say, thank God I don't have to go into a cave and, and call through a list of phone numbers again. <laughs> so like, I, I think there actually would be a tremendous welcome uh, if there were some alternate way of funding campaigns. But the whole system right now is set up so that the people who are good at raising money make it to the top of the party and they have the power to decide who gets to, to rise up and you have a pay for play system with the committees, especially in the Republican party. Uh, and you know, for whatever reason, Mitch McConnell has decided that the current campaign system uh, benefits Republicans and damned if any Republican is gonna challenge him on that in the Senate. I think it's a wonderful idea. I think we should bring some more former members of Congress to this program because they use much stronger terms than you when they describe what's happening. They usually refer to the, and let me again be gentle here because we have a very civil place here, but they talk about soliciting when they make those uh, uh, phone calls. Uh, just one sentence about the law. The, the law defines bribery only when there is an explicit bargain means you can go to a member of Congress, and I'm not making this up, and say, uh, next week there's a vote on a bill I'm interested in. Here's a $100 million contribution to your campaign. Next week I'll come back and we'll talk again. That is not considered a, a bribery. Only time is going to be bribery if you say, I'm not going to give you this campaign contribution unless you vote for my bill. So I think we could go a long way uh, to solve the problem if we would slightly tighten up the bribery law and, and recognize that when it's clear to any third party looking at the exchange that you promise something in return for a very specific, particular uh, outcome, that that was a, a bribery. Let's take the next comments, please. Hi, our next question is from Stephen. Contributions may access more than specific legislation, but aren't they quite effective at getting legislation that the big donors oppose blocked? Well, 
Well, I'll say, I'll say as a, I, and I, let me be very clear, I'm a registered lobbyist, so I spend a fair amount of time, as Lee had kind of referenced, talking to members. And uh, one of the things, if you've been around Capitol Hill at all for a while, you know, is it's always much easier to block something it is than to make something happen. So um, there are a lot of times where people put their thumbs on the scale or block uh, activity. And, uh, you know, it's not always getting the goodie. Sometimes it's making sure that nothing happens on an issue. I also just want to note that issue one has 200 former members of Congress in our Reformers Caucus. These are former members of Congress, governors and cabinet secretaries, who, as, uh, as Lee have noted, uh, come out of the system and want to speak out against the way this current system works. They know it backwards and forwards. And uh, we spent a lot of time at issue one working with those uh, former members and governors and cabinet secretaries so they can speak from firsthand experience about how the system works and what some of the most effective uh, solutions are. So we're trying to bring them into that dialogue every day. Of course, the single biggest problem is how tiny the limits are on donations. That's why they spend so much time on the phone. Well, we can argue about that, uh, but I don't want to monopolize more time. Anybody else? Hi, we have one question from Mindy. She asks, what about the convention path to a constitutional amendment? That would avoid the need to depend on Congress and the problem of just one party writing the, the amendment because it would be delegates from both major parties as well as non-affiliated delegates all necessarily working towards writing an amendment that would be popular enough to get ratified. This would ensure nothing too far, too, too far left or too far right would be proposed. Well, constitutional convention, um, I mean, yeah, th that, that would be a lot of fun for, for political science junkies like me to, to redesign, you know, the American Constitution, uh, which I think has a lot of flaws, although it was you know pretty good for the time. Uh, however, I, I think the, if you have an Article Five convention, then all the states would, uh, I think, I mean, who who knows? I, I, we've never had one, but I think then all the states would get treated equally. Um, so I think that would the small. So we, given that we have a lot of small conservative states, I think that would probably a constitutional convention would trend in a conservative direction. And I'm pretty sure it would be my guess if we had a constitutional convention, the end of it would be we'd have five or six different countries because we wouldn't be able to agree on on, on a compromise, uh, or we just revert to the to the existing. But you know, I, I you know. I, I think we could do a, we do we could do a lot better than the constitution that, that we have in a number of areas just because it was written in 1787 and it was a you know a radical experiment for its time that you know we 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 there's been a lot more constitution writing since and we know a lot more about what institutions uh, and and how how our institutions have worked and what institutional choices there are. Uh, I'll just make two points on the Constitutional Convention. It's an issue that's come up many times over the years. One is uh, scholars differ greatly, constitutional scholars, about the ability of anyone to determine once a Constitutional Convention, what issues would actually be on the table at the convention. Uh, kind of the, uh, and there's been disagreement on, uh, among those constitutional scholars as to what limits could be placed. Uh, and so some people say there can be, other people say there won't. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I know it's been a robust debate. There, I also just actually have a concern that in organizing for something like that, that in fact, it would provide yet another kind of uh, a venue where the wealthy organized interests would have the, the leg up because they would actually have the ability to go out around this very large country and get things organized to their benefit. So. I think there are a lot of open questions there, but the call for a constitutional convention is certainly understandable when you get to the problem that Scott's referred to, that it seems very difficult at the moment to get the people in office to be responsive to this desire. Okay. Did we exhaust all the questions? <laughs> Scott? 
Gabriel, Annette, did you have did you have more questions? Hi, that looks like that is it for the questions, unless any of the attendees wanted to raise their hand to talk to our panelists. That, that, that gives us all a, a chance for a last round because we have about five minutes left. Oh, we so, have one person that raised uh, their okay, hand. Well. Then, let, let's give them a voice. All right, John, you are on. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, uh, real quick, I just wanted to address something that uh, Lee just uh, said uh, with regards to mm -hmm. the convention. Um, the convention in Article 5 wouldn't be a rewriting of the Constitution. It's, I think, described in the Constitution itself as a convention for proposing amendments. So, like, the only thing that would come out of the convention would be a proposed amendment that would then need to be ratified by three-fourths of the states um, afterwards. Um, in that context, um, does your answer change about the idea of calling for a convention? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, I, I think we don't know how a convention would go. I'm not sure that's, I, I, if, that, if that were it, if it was, if, if it was just to propose amendments um, that have to be ratified by three fourths of the states, I'm, I'm guessing that we wouldn't find anything that three fourths of the states would ratify in which case it would be a big nothing burger. So, uh, so then fine, it would be an interesting intellectual exercise to see what, what we, what, what a, a group could agree on. Um, so go for it. Okay, but we coming, uh, each one of you can get a chance now. This time let's start with Scott uh, for uh, last words. Uh, and uh, I, I think we all recognize that as much as we would love a magic bullet, a silver bullet which will pass one thing and the whole problem will go away, I, I think probably all agree that, that unfortunately is uh, not in the cards. But last word, Scott. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, I've really been uh, enjoyed being here uh, and appreciate being invited. Uh, and I would just say that uh, in the next Congress, how about this? I'll propose a, a future conversation where we talk about uh, the, a whole sector we didn't hardly talk about, namely the nonprofit world, even though your three panelists here all are members of the nonprofit world. Uh, we're all at C3s or a C4. Uh, 501c3, 501c4, and the rest, those are at least as important as the political parties. Um, and we know that because the biggest donors on both sides give a lot more money in that realm than they do to hard political dollars, to uh, political parties or campaigns. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm not for regulating the speech of nonprofits, but if we're going to be regulating political speech, if we somehow decide that that's a good thing, then uh, we should regulate, I guess, the political speech of places like that, and also of corporations like uh, the Washington Post Company, the New York Times Company. They're certainly very powerful corporations uh, whose speech has an enormous impact on politics. But I hope we don't do any of that. Yeah, again, we talk about campaign contributions. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Nayla, last words? Well, the last words is, I think, you know, I've, I've long, when I've talked to university students and others, made the point that you get the government you deserve. And uh, you know, we had a problem here, not only of a lack of participation in terms of the campaign finance system, but also lack of, of voting. Uh, you know, so many of Americans don't even exercise the franchise. So when you hear these complaints, uh, hear Scott talk about you know, how he feels about the current incumbents, um, you know, some I like, some I don't. But you know, if you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. And too many Americans, don't vote, too many Americans don't uh, really make the contribution or get involved. So, you know, I kind of always had that view of what I said to my kids, you know, if you don't try and fix it, uh, you don't have a right to complain. But it's also the challenge we have in this pandemic that this is a time where using our kind of common uh, bonds as, as uh, American citizens is gonna be very important. It's really important that the election in November not only happens, but it's credible. And I hope uh, every voter will find some means 
to vote, whether it's you know, absentee ballot or early voting or in-person voting and do it safely. And on campaign contributions, we're just in a world where the system is not gonna change until the American people reward those candidates that seek to be a part of the change. And uh, that's hard to do in the system, but it's, it is the struggle and the struggle is what makes the democracy work. So I think it is the issue of our day uh, and the issue of our time but only if we really kind of reimagine what it means to be an American. Yeah, unfortunately, I have one, one minute for you. All right, well then I'll just second Meredith's point that this is an exciting time uh, in which we can, you know, I think, I think the coronavirus crisis opens up a lot of big conversations about what we want our democracy to, to be. And I am anticipating uh, you know, a new age of reform ahead once we clear out from this in which we, we really ask some of these big questions that we're starting to ask. And that's why dialogues like these are, are so important. Well, first of all, thank you all three of you for taking time from a uh, busy schedule for a very invigorating and frank and I think clear and civil uh, discussions. So very much appreciate that. And thank, thank you, very you much. Uh, for the comments you got. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, call you, a, this was our first trip and I'll, uh, please send us any comments or suggestions how uh, to do them even better in the future. And I invite you all to join us in May. I think it's May 25th. Uh, where we're going to discuss uh, uh, politics in the, uh, the age of the uh, virus with some outstanding uh, uh, participants, uh, panelists uh, who are on your screen now. Uh, thank you for joining us. Be safe.